So, uh, hi everybody, I am uh, Santiago Sarate, I guess some of you know me. I come today to talk about uh, how to shorten feedback loops uh, between uh, R&D and the real world by using OpenQA, uh, and of course, OpenSUSE in this case. Uh, the agenda today is, is, is kind of short. Um, I want to talk a little bit about who I am and why does it matter. Um, and I also want to talk a little bit uh, about how can OpenQA help in this, in this regard. And since we're talking about helping, uh, I also have three stories that I want to bring because stories allows, allow us to connect. Uh, and at the end, I would just say some final words. Um, originally, I am from Caracas, Venezuela. I have moved around a um, few continents. I worked previously um, in electronic voting systems. And I have been working with open source for quite some decades, right, uh, at this point. And currently, I am the um, product owner for QE Core. Uh, this is one team at SUSE. We are doing a lot of open QA. Um, when it comes to election-related work, or what I have been doing in regards, uh, in regards to elections, uh, I started in 2012 uh, as a product specialist uh, for the 2012 presidential elections in Venezuela. Um, at some point, I got promoted as a QA lead in 2013, uh, and I was working as a, um, I, I, uh, as a QA lead. I was developing the initial test plan that we were going to use for, let's call it, Project A. Uh, this was already a voting machine, completely new, completely different to what the company was, uh, had been developing before. Uh, and I was, aside from the initial test plan, working as well with the uh, software pro um, proof of concept, so preparing the test plan, how we are going to make sure that this thing is working correctly. Um, at some point, I was sent to the R&D department of the company in Taiwan. Uh, let's call it Project B. This is, again, a continuation of that initial machine. And I am specializing here. I'm, I'm working as a generalist, so I'm doing a lot of OS customization. I am doing a lot of firmware testing, and I was asked to write a driver for the scanner. Uh, just for the record, if you find it, don't use it. It has bugs. Uh, and then at some point, uh, because it's, we are basically building up, I end up as a, a functional query assurance lead for the 2016 Philippines general elections. Uh, and here I was basically doing what we call Deming cycle, which is plan, do, study, act. Now, why does it matter? Why is my previous experience relevant to this? And since I just mentioned Demings, here's a quote from him. Without data, you're just a person with, um, you're just a person with an opinion. And in this case, uh, the data that I bring is that elections are big. They take time, they need a lot of people, and they need a lot of computing. So for the 2015 um, parliamentary elections in Venezuela, they need, uh, we needed to, um, the company needed to deploy around 40,000 voting machines, and this is something that is affecting a whole country. It's 20 million, almost 20 million voters that are going to interact with each and one of those machines and they have to work properly just for one day, in the case of Venezuela. Now, uh, depending on the election, depending on the country, depending on where you are, they can look um, a lot different. So in this case, what we have is a direct recording um, electronic voting machine on the right. Uh, we have the electronic, voting, uh, electronic ballot in the middle, so you are just using your fingers to select, you're not uh, using a pen. And then what I called a uh, fingerprint reader on steroids, which is a um, voter authentication device. So there is no paper needed in this case. And the reality is that you don't know where your machines are going to end up. You don't know if they are going to be thrown from one boat to the other so that they can cross the river. 
And yes, this is a real example. They are actually throwing the machine from one place to the other. Uh, not the machine, they, they come in a suitcase. Now, moving a, li a little bit further to the Philippines, um, when, I say that they, when, I, when I say that they are big, we are talking that for the 2012 general elections, they had a contract of 250 million euro. Um, they wanted to develop a new voting machine. And they did the same for the 2016 general elections, which is the one that I was directly working for. Um, so I was kind of responsible for the deployment of 92,000 uh, machines. Uh, so that includes the testing of the machines, the firmware that they were running, and just making sure that they were able to behave as they should by the time the election was happening. And we are talking about almost 60 million uh, eligible voters, so 60 million people are putting ballots inside the voting machines. And these machines in particular, they had, very, uh, they have a, a, they had a lot of small things that had also to be tested, so they were accessible machines, so that meant that if somebody uh, could, not, um, uh, could, could not see, for instance, they could connect the headphones and they could vote using their um, uh, using auditive cues. Um, then there were security keys that also had to be tested for the poor workers. There was a, there, uh, the machine had a printer, so once the vote is, uh, is being casted, you get a confirmation of what your vote is, and then you decide to put it into the into the ballot. Now. Uh, I, 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 I want to bring back again the cost of, a, of, of an election. So this is for the 2022 gen, uh, elections that happened two, three weeks ago or something like this. And just the part that belongs to the automation part of the election was uh, 56 million euro. So there is a lot of money here. And there is a lot, there are a lot of things that need to happen for an election to be able to, uh, to get to, to, to a proper good ending. Um, and I'm not talking, uh, so it's 50, uh, 56 million, not, uh, not counting the logistics, the transmissions, ballots, servers, and audits, and many other parts. So this is just voting machines and the software. Now, when we are talking about the elections, when we are thinking about them, uh, we mostly see the part where we are going to the, uh, to the voting booth, we are casting our votes, and then we are waiting for the results. But what we don't see normally is how many, um, how many steps have to be taken in order for us to get to that, mo to that point. Now, I want to put a pin here, and I want to talk a little bit about OpenQA. Normally, when I, uh, when I express or when I'm talking to somebody what is, it, what is OpenQA, I like to, to introduce it as a puppet and the puppet master. So OpenQA is going to do exactly what it is being told to do. Uh, it's going to interact with a system under test or, or, or a machine through either uh, VNC through uh, SSH through serial consoles. So it will behave pretty much as, a, as, as I will do, as a user would do. And it has uh, multiple backends that allow it to interact with multiple devices. Um, I also uh, like to introduce it as a continuous testing tool that you can simply take and plug into the continuous integration solution that you have so that um, teams can have a full cycle of uh, building, building your software, testing your software, and deploying it. But when it comes to the testing, that you are doing uh, not only just unit testing or just uh, running some integration tests, but that you can do full system tests uh, and even end-to-end -end tests if you so want. And OpenQA is also being used by 
or friends from Fedora, friends from uh, Debian, GNOME Foundation, if I remember correctly, has also one instance. And recently, the, the friends from KubeOS Cube uh, have been testing their, um, their operating system with OpenQA, I think, already for a while. Uh, and this is what we use um, mainly at SUSE and OpenSUSE for uh, releasing, the soft, uh, releasing every build of the operating system. This is how we know that whatever we are releasing to the, to the, to the customers, whatever we are releasing to the public, uh, to the OpenSUSE users, is battle tested. So we know that it works. And here is where I want to try to make a connection between elections and OpenQA, which is why I brought those three stories today. And I want to come back to this slide. And yes. Um, and the first story is my story. This is this Santiago that you see here is me. Um, when, it, uh, when, I, when I was working for, for, for this particular project, uh, I face the problem that elections are heavily um, regulated. And in particular for the Philippines, we have to comply with the vol voluntary voting system guidelines. Uh, these, are, these come from the EAC, uh, so Electoral Commission, something in the United States. Uh, but we have to comply uh, with um, some of those rules. And not only with that, but we also have to pass a certain level of certification for MISRA, uh, for MISRA standards, and on top of that, FIS 142. So there are, there are a lot of things that have to be checked before we are able to get to the election day. Uh, now, in, in, all those, in all those processes, all those audits, there is one, proce one part of the process called trusted bill. Uh, the trusted build is kind of the gate before anything can be put actually into the election, and anything that happens before uh, is not that doesn't really matter, but you have to build towards the trusted build. When you get to this moment, uh, you can certify that that software can go to the election. And the problem with this is that, mm, sorry, uh, the problem with this is that uh, a trusted build is a moment where it's all or nothing. So you have, I don't know, uh, it can be seven, 10, 15 people sitting in a room creating a compound password. So each person has a very small part of that password. They all type that into a single machine. And this is the machine that is going to be used to build the operating system images that are going to build the operating system images for the rest of the systems. So it's kind of one or three, uh, from one to three levels of building that, uh, that is happening. Uh, and the problem with this is that A, is super expensive when it comes to time, uh, and since, since it's an all or nothing, that means if the process fails almost at the end, you have to start all over again because um, the, it's, it's, um, there is a timestamp that, that is being calculated. It depends on how do you want to do the implementation. But it's usually all or nothing. Uh, and the important part here is that anything that comes out of this process is uh, what is going to guarantee to the, to the, to the public, to the, to the voters, that whatever was being built, was being compiled on that day, is being also used during the election. All this information is public, and it can be uh, validated. Um, now, the problem is the, the problem that I had is we started this part of the of, of the process. So we we developed the script for the trusted build something like one year one year and a half before the election day, and the script worked. It was uh, doing its job. So. Uh, there, was, there was one part of this process that we will take a USB drive, we will connect it to the machine, start the process, wait for the script to instruct us to remove the USB drive. We remove, 
we wait, we insert it again, we remove it, and then uh, it's kind of done. The problem is when you are having 20 plus USB drives on your desk, and it's not just your desk, but it's the desk of your colleague because your colleague is testing a different configuration. And then the colleague, two, um, two seats in front of you, is also doing the same. At one point, you are going to cross. At one point, you are going to miss the right USB drive that you were using for your build. So in the eighth hour, you realize that you don't have the right key anymore, so you have to start over. And because we are humans, at some point, uh, many of us decided to simply skip the part of removing the USB drive and putting it again, so we will let it connect it to the machine. Now, uh, something like six months before the election, uh, we are doing the kind of the final testing. So we have three teams in, in three different time zones, and in one of them, this process is failing. So the team uh, where I was at the testing laboratory, was uh, the tests were passing. The team uh, in the client, the tests were passing as well. But the team w that was testing the documentation, not the software, not the machines, they were testing the documentation, they were failing these tests. And because of com confirmation bias, uh, we start to take a look at what can go wrong, and we say, okay, there is a new person that just joined that team. Most likely because of this person is because these tests are failing. So it took us around two days to figure out that the problem was not what the person was doing, it was what we were doing. So at some point, the script changed, and the script had a bug, and we didn't realize. So only after trying to figure out uh, where was the problem is when we realized, okay, so we need to change something. And it, it took us two weeks to get the change included into the build because the solution had to be, had to be, had to be sent from the, the, the headquarters to the testing laboratory. The testing laboratory had to, had to do the, aud the auditing and only then it could be included into the solution and because there are a lot of signatures happening all along the way, it's, it's just not immediate process. And this is the part where OpenQA could have helped us. Uh, we could have used OpenQA to automate the creation of the images for those laptops, for those servers, even for the voting machines. Uh, to generate every single build, every single ISO, and even the election data so that we could validate the user interfaces, the hardware, um, the data, and the whole trusted build process uh, in total. Now, uh, one thing uh, that OpenQA could, could have made easier uh, is that we could have had peer review tests because, again, when you are working 16 plus hours, uh, five engineers per team, and this is almost every day of the week, including, including weekends and holidays. And this is a team of uh, five, five, so it was five engineers uh, per team and around seven teams that we had that were just doing different levels of testing. Uh, and a lot of this was manual. We had some, some automated tests, but not all, uh, and the problem is that every team was on the verge of, of burnout. Every team, um, whenever we needed to run an end-to-end, -end, we needed to prepare something like three days before we could, we could start the end-to-end, -end. and to, be, to actually finish, we needed to, we needed to take uh, between one to two days. Uh, so just imagine that one part of the process is damaged, or one part of the process doesn't go well. Um, and here is where the help of OpenQA um, could have helped us to, for instance, have normal working hours, uh, to have less stress during milestones, even uh, allow us to, uh, to be home for dinner, because many times I was going back home at 3 a.m. in the morning on a Sunday. 
Now, uh, I was mentioning um, teams and engineers and ours. So if you, if you sit down and you start to look, we are talking about engineers per hours per team. And we had seven teams uh, of, of five engineers. So you, you can start to multiply 16 by, by, by. So that's the first story. Now, the second story is Donna Bay. Donna Bay basically was trying to hunt for a bug that was disappearing every time she was hunting for it. Um, the problem with this bug is that it was introduced by some developer, um, and it was hidden in between the firmware and the software that was interacting with the scanner itself. One of the problems that we were facing is that, um, or actually, the bug was happening because it was, it was a multiple of 512. So every time the image resulting of the scanning of a ballot was a multiple of 512, the scanner would hang. Now, the problem is, how, how do you make it happen? Because how do you make it happen and how do you figure out where the bug is? Because it's happening maybe one, once every thousand scans or something like this. And we had, in the, in, in the type A office, we had the firmware being developed. In the uh, Panama office, we have the software being developed. So whenever the firmware engineers were releasing a new version, were releasing a new version, most likely the people in the Panama office were already out picking up their kids, going for dinner, having a life. So this will introduce unnecessary um, delays because we needed to basically wait just to have feedback because the machines that they had in the, in, in the type A office were not the same that they had in the Panama office because hardware revisions and so on and so forth. Uh, and then we had the problem that the, t the, the, the setup was tedious because we had to take one SD card, take it from the machine, uh, take it from the laptop, connect it on the machine, run, the, uh, run some testing software, see that it was not hap the bug was not happening, come back, to the, come back to the laptop, connect it again, and it was very, very tedious to the point that often the QA of, of that very specific part was simply left um, to the end. That had troubles further along the line, but let's not get there. Now, I'm just talking about the scanner, but we also had the headphones. Uh, we also had the security keys, the printers, and even the paper because the, the ballots had a, a, a UV mark as well. And there is a funny story there, but that is not for today. Now, the main question is, how do you test this with something like this? And the answer is, you fake it until you make it. And this is uh, in partly something that we were doing, but not with something like OpenQA. So, with OpenQA, you have the, the, the web UI where you can take a look at the results. Everything looks nice, everything looks shiny, and you see these, uh, these uh, green bubbles, these red bubbles when things, are, uh, when things are failing, and you can take a look at the other results and so on and so forth. That, that doesn't look right, anyway. Um, now, I want to focus on the backends, because the backends are the things that is the component of OpenQA that allows it to interact with multiple, with multiple, multiple machines. So we're talking about public cloud, we're talking about uh, mainframes and power systems. Uh, but in this case, I want to talk specifically about real hardware. So I want to focus just on, the, on that circle that you see there, which is backends, uh, at least from the architectural uh, point of view. And here we have uh, some efforts from the community, from our colleagues, uh, where we are actually, right now at this point in time, 
testing Raspberry Pis with OpenQA. So we are basically booting a Raspberry Pi with an with the next image that we are going to release, testing it, and then waiting for the next uh, circle around uh, by using a device that looks very similar to this. So it is connected to, I think, a computer or another Raspberry Pi. I'm not 100% sure, uh, but it's a, a, a SD card multiplexer or something like this. And what it, what it does is basically allows um, uh, OpenQA to write uh, an image to the SD card. Uh, there is also power management uh, integrated into it. And it allows OpenQA to simply, con simply control the whole cycle. So put the, uh, put the image, turn on the machine, and also uh, interact with the keyboard and mouse. And there is, a, um, there is even a, li a link to it if you want to take out your phones and, and look at it. And you can also do it with your laptops as well. Uh, the peeps from QB, QBOS are also doing that. They connected a servo motor to a Raspberry Pi. And what they are doing is they are turning on and off the laptop with a Raspberry Pi, and that's doable. So it's a lot of outside of the box thinking. And the reason why they are doing it with a laptop in that way is because they, are, they contributed to OpenQA by adding the AMT backend, AMT backend, which is, I don't remember what it, what it, what it means right now, but it's basically, um, I think it's active management technology uh, by Intel, that it allows uh, another system to basically take control of uh, of some some Intel laptop, basically. And this is there; it's already in OpenQA. Uh, it's already added uh, into the OS Auto Ins backend, um, OS Auto Ins project, and there is also a link to the write-up from QBOS. Now. When, when we come back a little bit to how OpenQA could have helped um, um, in, this, in, in many of these regards, uh, is that it could have helped us to have feedback in a matter of minutes. It could have helped us to not have to wait until the team in Panama is awake to know whether whatever the firmware engineer is trying to build works properly. Or it could have helped us to figure out quicker that the bug was a problem in the driver and not the firmware, because this is where we were hunting, because we didn't know where, where the problem actually was. Um, it could have helped us to have end-to-end -end tests even before we had the full solution. So we could have simply start to scale the, the, the testing um, at every step whenever we are adding a new functionality or whenever we are adding a new software back, a new software to the, to the election, to, to the electoral solution. Uh, it would ha have allowed us to also plan better, uh, better testing scenarios and reduce the amount of human hours needed for testing. And now, now the, last, uh, the last story is kind of a short one, uh, but it's rather bringing Morphe's law to the, um, to the scenery. Because uh, even after 10 elections, talking to a, um, to a solutions manager, uh, this person was still having the same fears. We are going to have problems with the election because we are not able to get the election data until two, or, uh, until two weeks or one month before the election. So you don't actually have the full, the full data set to run a full-scale election. Running an end-to-end -end test uh, of, of the full election is just impossible because you don't have the manpower until the election day. Um, 
you are also risking the projects going over budget. And this is very easy because you will end up having teams travel from across the world just to try to solve a very small problem that it was just difficult to catch. Uh, you can also have problems when it comes to a uh, um, supply chain crisis due to a pandemic. And again, if you are relying on a lot of manual testing just to try to ensure the quality of your product, you might have some troubles because then also you can, in the end, have a war. And this is very real. So OpenQA can help. Using a, a little bit of out-of-the-box thinking, you can get further, you can get results faster, and you can even get um, reduction in terms of cost if you want to look at it. Uh, but in reality, what you can have is better uh, a product with better quality, with developers, with your team being a little bit less stressed when it comes to whatever solution you are putting together. And before I finish, I just want to leave you with a quote. Uh, and is that I believe in the philosophy that we are humans, not robots. But when it comes down to testing, my money is on the robots. Now, uh, if you want to find the code, do, you can go to open.qa. Uh, you can find me as 469 on almost every social network, including Twitter. And that's it. Thank you. Sorry? Did you want to take questions? I can take questions, if there are. No, there are no questions. There are two. So, Anton? Sorry? Okay, so the thing is you have to deliver, uh, one of the deliverables is how to run the election. So there are multiple manuals that go from how to set up the elector, elect, election management service to election, election management system to how to operate the voting machine. One of those, uh, one of those deliverables or one of those documents is uh, running the trusted build. And this is actually, uh, if I remember correctly, the second or third document that you have to go through. During this, um, d during the read, uh, readout of this document, you have to take the document and you have to go through the checklist running every single command or, or, or typing every single instruction on the laptop. And it's not that you can type whatever you want. You have to type exactly what is on the manual. So you test the documentation by executing every single instruction as it is written. And this is how we figure out that there was this very small bug. Thank you. Oli? Yeah. You're, you're saying you're saving the world by OpenQA, I believe you. Um, how would this a situation look like with the examples of thinking outside of the box with something like uh, Jenkins? Yeah. Would it work the same? Uh, can you... Uh, y using Jenkins, you know, with a Raspberry Pi controlling the notebook power switch and all that, would it also be possible the same or what would be the differences? Would it make your life harder? So we have... Uh, we had different solutions to, to, to try to do some um, automated testing. Uh, the thing with Jenkins uh, is that we would have had to um, prepare some sort of bridge between uh, the, the, the hardware and whatever software uh, we wanted to run. So OpenQA is a solution that is already there. It exists. And, uh, you, you have software like Lava, for instance, that um, allows you to also interact with hardware, uh, with hardware to, a, to a certain level, uh, and it's actually used for testing. 
Um, so what, with Jenkins being a CI, you can just take OS altcoins, uh, make it run, or take Lava and make it run, but you have to build the gadget. So the, when, when I say outside of the box thinking, I refer exactly about this. Uh, because for instance, uh, one of the voting devices, one of the voting machines that the company had uh, was a touchscreen. And that is basically a serial device that is being connected to a TTY. So if you want to do some automated testing and emulate that, uh, you could simply uh, even wire um, or emulate the, the inputs from the touchscreen through an Arduino connected to a Raspberry Pi and then pass those signals to another machine and then process it on your software, for instance, if you want to see that every single click is being detected uh, on that way. Uh, that's why I said fake it until you make it. Hmm? Oh, you have a question? Did you have a question? Yeah, one question. Sati, uh, can I also ask like, generic question about open QA, QA not about the examples. I feel that in upcoming year we will have a great opportunity if we build up open and the testing happens public, you know, just like we built it OBS, we could test it in the open QA, open org. I feel that we can get a lot of attention from like the partners that will actually see the actual results of, you know, testing before we actually report it. They can see it live. I feel that this could be really great for the entire project because we could get a lot of, you know, maybe feature requests mm -hmm. for the reports so partner can find it maybe more useful, easier. Are you actually looking forward for that and would you support it or would you prefer if it would be tested in-house? And, you know, like your opinion about testing of future products publicly. So, uh, if I understood correctly, you are... Hmm? Basically, the question is if you also see the benefits of possibly testing out outside of the company, you know, like in OpenK, OpenSUSE, or yes. where partners could access it. Your opinion, please. Yes. The, uh, so, I, I do see a benefit if uh, more and more people are either deploying their own OpenQI instances or if they are um, a, and they contribute with the extensions that, that they might do. Uh, uh, just to, to, to adequate uh, OpenQA to, to, to their needs. Um, but, of course, uh, using the, the, the public instances that they are there, they, and this is something that, that right now is available, and there is kind of a community around it. But, yeah, it depends on, on where do we want to go. My point was mostly about like increasing visibility like massively, you know, because SLES is, or whatever SLES next will be, you know, will be tested there. I hope so. Like, yeah. That will just help the project and so on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. uh, one last question and then we'll, we'll move on. If, it, if anyone has one. So, no, 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 I, no, I, have, I have no questions. Thank you, Santi. That was a great talk. Thank you. And uh, I appreciate everyone.